I'm not a snob person before that. So actually I am a person who studied astronomy, strangely enough. And during astronomy I ended up doing molecular physics. So I did my PhD in molecular physics with cross molecular beams where you need to do a lot of spectroscopy, a lot of molecular control, you do a lot of high resolution, low resolution spectroscopy. So I had a molecular physics background, really. At the same time, I was in a department where on top of me, there was one of the pioneering group in scanning tunneling microscopy, and one of my friends was an STM. So I was very interested in this topic already during my PhD times because of that. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult question because the word snom didn't exist in those words, specifically in those times. So I was indirectly having contact with people in scanning tunneling microscopy. After my PhD, I went to a laboratory where I worked on linear optics, but together with people working on atomic force microscopy. And then in the literature reading, I found work of Dieter Pohl, which was mentioning snom. SNOM. So these were papers of Dieter Pohl of 84 and 85, typically. It must have been 85, I think. It was a bit of a curiosity thing. So after my PhD, I had a project on nonlinear optics, organic molecules and these kind of things. At the same time, I worked together with a biophysical group who wanted to develop scanning probe microscopy to look at biological stuff. So we had some scanning probe development going on, which in those days meant you better first build an STM and then convert that into an atomic force microscope. And doing that, I having myself having a molecular physics background, I really like the idea that it should have optical contrast. So we started putting light at STM tips to see whether we could gain some extra contrast there. Then atomic force microscopy turned out easier than STM because it's just the interaction is easier, you don't have to work in vacuum. In 1989, the first county levels came out, so atomic force microscopy became really easy. And then of course it was obvious for me to put light on those things and see whether we could get more contrast. which gave us some things, but we didn't know how to interpret it those days. So it was an endeavor, but it was, a, was good fun at the same time, because it gave an extra thing on top of scanning probe microscopy, what was common, getting common those days. I had a background in molecular physics with molecular beams. And when you work with molecular beams, you think you work with single molecules, because all the molecules interact individually with each other. So you interpret everything as if you have single molecules, although each molecule ends up in the pump. Doing scanning probe microscopy on a table at room temperature, your dream is, can I actually see these molecules and keep them there and go back to the molecule and look at them? So doing STM, atomic resolution, you're there, but it was vacuum and only semiconductor stuff or metallic stuff would work. Going to atomic force microscopy, we already managed to get, again, atomic resolution, but only topography, ne never, never spectroscopy, never looking at an active real molecule. So one of my dreams was to see indeed these molecules on the surface in some spectroscopic contrast. That, that was right from the beginning there. And yeah, technologically we were far from that. So we have been trying this in the early 90s, particularly when we got to aperture probes. We were scanning around on surfaces with lower and lower concentration. So in 94 and 95, we had the first glitches of things that looked like glitching, blinking events. And then scanning around, we sometimes got like blobs with a kind of cutoff because it got bleached. So 95, we had some real data on, on yeah, blinking on and off of, of bleaching off of molecules. So that looked like singles. And then comparing that to what at the same time Pat Ambrose had published the year before, it, I got convinced we had also single molecules, yes. Mm. 
Atomic force microscopy is a basic technology with a quite clear contrast and a quite clear methodology how to do it compared to scanning knee foot optical microscopy. So EFM works in the hands of most people. You can put a tip down and you can go a bit too much, a bit too little, but you will not crash it. You always get data. On top of that, you can actually measure a bit forces and you can get topography at the same time. So this had success, although we have to be honest on the fact that AFM, the moment it became a tool, it has saturated and AFM is not like the technology anymore. It's more, uh, I want to characterize my sample and any chemist or biologist always tries the AFM to characterize the sample when it's a surface thing. Neefield optics never came to the point like, okay, I have a sample, let's try. Because the tips have never been defined what they should be, the contrast you want to get to dictate which tip you need, and the tip you cannot make, not buy, but you need to make it. So you have a technical problem. On top of that, it's much more interesting physics because it's sub-wavelengths optical physics. Eh? We call that nano-optics these days. So the contrast is the interaction of your tip with the sample, and the sample is as much a near field thing as the tip is a near field thing, and the interaction between the two is what you measure. And you cannot pretend to say, I have a snum, I put a sample and I get an image. That hardly is the case. And that's good for the physics behind it, but it's bad if you want to sell a routine working instrument, which the contrast is ill-defined of so far, or at least it's too rich to know what you're doing. Yeah, so 1995 was the times when scanning probe microscopy had gotten mature. So scanning tunnel microscopy would work well, atomic force microscopy worked well, and they were moving into applications. And for example, that AFM worked in liquid. And so I was a lot in scanning probe microscopes because I was quite active in atomic force microscopy those days. So scanning probe community. And they always had this little corner of optics people who did SNUM, but they were always the weird ones in that community because they had this technology that could deliver so much more, but it actually would never really work. Which was okay, because those were the days of trying and getting things to work and anything you got was better than before. So it was a very dynamic, interesting time, but also a bit frustrating because half of the time the whole experiment wouldn't work because of lack of technological control and tip fabrication issues. But my community was mainly scanning probe microscopy in 1995, I think. Of course, one can say disappointed that SNOM after all these years never became something that works. But we learned a lot through it. And we also found out that SNOM is not a microscope, it's a physics interaction system where you measure things and you learn nano-optical control, you learn about physical interactions, you learn about coupling between molecular things and things that you put close to it trying to control it. It has connections with scanning probe microscopy, it has connection with quantum optics, it has connections with molecular physics. So I think it has been developed very rich in that sense. So the word disappointment doesn't really apply, I think. But if you put expectations, we want to have a working microscope like that and with one nanometer resolution, no, of course that never came there. Well, nano-optics got mature, but it's still not there. So, so one of the fundamentals we still have is still fabrication. So we can make plasmonic structures or antennas or knee field probes, but the control of that is, is still limited. And every year we see we're getting little but better on that. So we're now having a control on the 20 or 10 nanometer scale. But the, actually the real interaction, stronger interactions happen on the few nanometer scale. Technologically we can just, yes, just not control this. And we know that if you want to have stronger interaction, this is actually the distance where these things happen. And you see people still kind of doing very indirect, desperate experiments to try to get something working at that scale. 
So that's technological the challenge. Of course, nano optics, you have the bridge between single photon sources and technological control. So in quantum optics, I think it has a big potential. If we want ever to get something like, like a bright single photon source, nano optics is I think still the way to go there. On the other hand, which sources then should be there? We all know molecules bleach, we know that quantum dots also don't live forever. So there's lots of challenges still also on the, on the source side, which sources should give all these photons we want to get on the nanometer scale. Nowadays, defects in 2D materials are fashionable. Also there, it's to be seen how far that gets. So it's an interesting field, because it moves, it moves, it moves, it moves. Yeah?